Good afternoon and welcome everybody to our first lecture in the Carbon Management Distinguished Lecture Series that is organized by the Columbia Climate Center. The Climate Center is part of the Earth Institute and as most or all of you know, the main mission of the Earth Institute is sustainable development, which means to understand where we are heading with our planet from here into the future and where we have uh, ended up. Climate, of course, is a big part of the topics that evolve within the uh, orbit of sustainable development. And within the uh, topics that evolve around climate, greenhouse gas emissions and management, and within that, carbon as the major greenhouse gas, have a specific uh, role to play. So the Climate Center has actually, since its inception, paid quite a bit of attention to that. And as part of our programs that include uh, modeling of carbon emissions, uh, climate change education, but also an as an important element, carbon management, uh, we have um, spun up a program that will establish a professional master's degree in carbon management. And within these activities, we um, are looking at carbon management in, in a more general term, in a, in a, on a broader basis, and to inform ourselves from outside our own community, we have established the uh, Distinguished uh, Lecture Series. And I'm uh, glad that we have a, a very distinguished guest who will be introduced by Teresa. Um, and I would like to welcome Teresa to the podium to do this introduction. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, so, our distinguished speaker, Richard Houghton, is a senior scientist at the Woods Hole Research Center in Massachusetts. The center is an independent nonprofit institute focused on environmental science, education, and policy. Houghton has studied the interactions of terrestrial carbon, terrestrial ecosystems with the global carbon cycle and climate change for about 30 years, um, in particular documenting changes in land and determining the sources and sinks of carbon attributable, attributable to land management. Um, he's participated in IPCC assessment reports and U.S. Climate Change Science Program's first state of the carbon cycle report, the North American Carbon Budget and Implications for the Global Carbon Cycle. Houghton has been with um, the Woods Hole Research Center since 1987 and served two years as a visiting scientist, senior scientist at NASA. Um, he has worked as a research scientist at Brookhaven National Laboratory in New York and the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole. Houghton received his PhD in ecology from SUNY at Stony Brook in 1979, and he has an honorary doctorate from the Faculty of Forest Science in University of Munich in 1995. Um, one of his projects, the Pantropical Carbon Mapped with satellite and field observations is the subject of a recent New York Times blog piece, A Clearer Picture of Tropical Carbon. Um, he is also a co author of an article related to the same project, um, Estimated Carbon Dioxide Emissions from Tropical Deforestation Improved by Carbon Density Maps. This is heavy stuff. Um, that was in the January 2012 issue of Nature Climate Change. Um, so, with that, please help me welcome Richard Houghton to the podium. Thank you, Teresa, and thank you all for coming. Um, <clears throat> it's, a, it's an honor to be here and give this talk. I, uh, I'm going to be speaking about not the actual management on the ground in any one particular place, but more uh, a global view of, of what one might do with land if you were interested in reducing emissions or increasing carbon sinks on land. <clears throat> okay, and I'm going to talk about three things, not for very long. I'm going to start out by talking about the global carbon cycle. Most of you will probably know this, uh, and, but I think it's a good place to start. And then I'll talk about managing, how it might be managed on land, how carbon might, and then talk a little bit about the unmanaged lands and what they're doing or might do with carbon. Uh, first, the global carbon cycle. These are slides that I've swiped from the uh, 
Global Carbon Project. <coughs> uh, they're on a, on a website there, but this is, uh, this shows <coughs> 1850 to 2008 in this case. You, you, you probably don't want to pay too much attention to the numbers. I'm going to talk mostly about 2000 to 2010. This is an earlier slide. It's slightly different. But the point is that above that zero line are releases or sources of carbon to the atmosphere, which you can see in this case it's from land use, that is converting natural systems to agriculture by and large. It also includes the uh, harvesting of wood from forests. But during this whole period, 160 almost years, uh, the net and the net flux of carbon from human use of land has been to release carbon, has been a source to the atmosphere, uh, starting off somewhat less than one, and not, <clears throat> and, and today it's, again, it's come down, we think, but I'm not sure. In this graph, for the period 2000 to 2008, the emissions were about 1.4 petagrams of carbon per year. Um, <clears throat> You'll see why the slide is so thin in the next, because compare the land use change emissions with fossil fuel emissions, which are now, uh, which are currently uh, over nine petagrams of carbon per year, billion metric tons. Uh, and those are the, those two, the net flux from changes in land use and the emissions from fossil fuels are, are the anthropogenic emissions of carbon to the atmosphere they have to, for mass accounting, equal accumulations of carbon somewhere, and that's what that lower line shows, that somewhere, it doesn't say where, but somewhere all of the carbon that's released has to, has to find its way to something else. Now the first, one of the things we know best is the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide, so we can measure each year the growth in carbon, uh, mostly as CO2, in the atmosphere. The reason the wiggles start getting very large after about 1960 or so is because those are actual measurements in the atmosphere at Mauna Loa and the South Pole. Before that, the smoothing just means that the data came from ice cores and there's a lot of averaging going on. Uh, presumably they were wiggly the whole way through. <clears throat> um, ocean models uh, account for an uptake of carbon by the by the oceans and that in this period was averaged about 2.3 so you can see almost half of the total emissions stayed in the atmosphere about a quarter went into the oceans and then by difference uh, another quarter or so is estimated to have um, accumulated on land now I have to point out that uh, all of these estimates except that last one are based on data and models or some combination and that estimate of 2.7 per year uptake on land has never has never been measured uh, it's it's just determined from the other four terms in this in this equation that has to balance uh, so we don't we have hypotheses but we don't know where that accumulation is occurring and we really don't have a good idea of, of exactly why. And we have, like I say, several uh, hypotheses. Um, now I'm going to jump up to the period 2000 to 2010. It's pretty much the same, same figure. In this case, the oceans are on the bottom, the atmosphere is in the middle. But again, the uptake by the oceans and atmosphere and land each year have to equal the total emissions. And when I say land, um, if you think about this slide, land appears twice. It's, it's above the zero line, that's a, it's a source when it's considering those lands managed or used by humans. And it's a, it's a sink, it's a, uh, an uptake of carbon pretty much this whole period um, in systems not, in, in the natural systems, in systems not logged, cleared, otherwise used or managed by humans. Uh, you, could, you can also see that this, this sink on land uh, pretty much didn't exist at all before 1900, which means 
that the emissions from land use were uh, were the only uh, the only source of carbon to the atmosphere, and it was being up taken up by the oceans and accumulating in the atmosphere. And it wasn't until around 1900 or so that that land started to accumulate carbon again in natural systems. And we don't know why. All of the calculations here are, are again the land uptake is based on knowing the other terms. And this is just showing it one more time the way I, I like this graph a lot. There are a lot of things that come on come out of it when you spend some time with it. I'll talk about a couple of those things. But again, fossil fuels are the largest emissions of carbon, especially in the 20th century. But before that, the largest emissions were from land. Um, and then the uptake here is oceans, land, and atmosphere. <clears throat> uh, just a little bit about what's been happening more recently, this is since 1990, annual emissions from just fossil fuel and cement. Cement adds a few percent to fossil fuels. And you can see that it's been generally increasing, in fact, uh, accelerating the releases per year, except for 2009 when we had the financial, global financial crisis. And you can see that carbon dioxide emissions from just fossil fuel and cement was, was down by about 1.3 percent that year. Over the course here, the rate of increase has been, the rate of increase itself has been increasing from around 1 percent to uh, 3 percent. And then last, in the, in the last year, 2010, the increase was in fact almost 6 percent in that year alone. So the, it, so the emissions are accelerating. I won't get into why, but it's largely uh, <clears throat> China, India, developing countries that are plunging ahead with, with growth and emissions, and much of the developed world has, has come closer to leveling off emissions. Uh, this is just to show a little bit how, in history, you can see the effects of economic activity on the, the annual emissions. You can see the oil crisis in 1973. There's a downturn attributed here to U.S. savings and loan crisis. I think it was also 79 was the second oil shock, I, I think, so that must have contributed. <clears throat> Collapse of the former Soviet Union. And you can see again the dip in 2009, which we have more than recovered from in one sense. Uh, all right, so I'm going to move right to a little bit more to what could you do with land if you wanted to uh, either reduce emissions of carbon or take carbon out of the atmosphere. And as I said in the beginning, I'm going to take a very global view. I'm not going to tell you how to cultivate or anything of that sort, but uh, this slide is to make the point that the goal is stabilization of carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. If we could stabilize the concentration then we would not be driving changes in climate further. Um, and the concentrations shown here are from the black line from Mauna Loa, the much more, ver sorry, the other way around. The black line's from the South Pole, fairly um, unvariable through time. The red one is at Mauna Loa, which shows the, the seasonal pattern of uptake and release due to m largely terrestrial activity in the Northern Hemisphere. The same slide again, just I'm showing how decade by decade, decade the average rate of growth in atmospheric concentrations has been increasing from about 1.3 to almost 2 to 1.9. And on the right shows actual parts per million growth rate by year. So the, the emissions are going up despite the UNFCCC and the uh, agreement to uh, stabilize concentrations at a level that would not cause uh, danger to the climate system. Uh, we think the contributions to those emissions are from fossil fuels and land use change. And I, I show here the, con the fraction of the emissions from land as opposed to fossil. If you look at the whole period, 1850 to 2010, Land use change contributed about 30 percent of carbon emissions. That has dropped to 20 percent in the decade of the 90s, 
and to about 11 percent in the dec in the first decade of 2000, uh, which is largely just because of the rate of fossil fuel increase. There's some indication that deforestation rates have come down, but uh, that's not universally uh, agreed to. So <clears throat> here, here are the numbers for the period 2000-2010, the annual sources from fossil fuels and from land use change, and then the annual sinks in the atmosphere, oceans, and residual. This this other terrestrial that's in natural systems, this other terrestrial sink is, is termed the residual terrestrial sink because, as I said, it's determined by difference. It's not uh, directly measured. Um, all right, so if the challenge is to stabilize the concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, one way to do that overnight would be to reduce emissions by 4.1 petagrams of carbon per year. The atmospheric growth rate is, is, is that much currently, and if you reduced emissions by that much, you wouldn't do anything to the sinks right away, so they would stay where they are. So um, I'll, come, I'll come back to that to finish that point. So if the goal is stabilization, there are two things you could do with land that would have a big effect. One is stop deforestation. Stop the changes in land use that are deforestation that lead to a release of about one petagram per year. And you could reforest large areas of the land. Let me say a little bit, little bit more. This uh, graph shows the flux, annual flux of carbon from 1920 to 2010 from changes in land use. It looks like there's a great a deal of scatter. In fact, there's less scatter than was reported in the last IPCC reports. Uh, so this is a, this is somewhat, it looks as though an error here is of plus or minus 0.5 or less, which is, which is better than we had been doing. Uh, so again, stopping deforestation would probably reduce emissions, total emissions by about one petagram. And expanding the area of forest by a lot, 500 million f hectares is, is uh, a little more than half the area of the United States. And I'm not arguing that this would be easy or that the United States is the place to put it, but, and it doesn't have to be in any one place, but if you were to be really serious and trying to expand forests, this is the area that would be involved and you might, again, take out a pedogram of carbon over several decades as a result of reforestation. So using land alone, you might reduce emissions or increase sinks by two petagrams of carbon per year. <clears throat> uh, stopping deforestation helps in, in another way besides reducing emissions. It also, to the extent that forests play a big role in that natural sink that I talked about, the more forests you have out there, the more active they can be in sort of perpetuating that natural sink. Um, expanding forests by 500 million hectares, is that at all realistic? Well, well, the good news is that we actually manage three times that area in crops globally and five times that area is in pasture and rangeland, so it's not inconceivable from that point of view. On, on the other hand, identifying where those millions of hectares are is, is, would be tricky. I think uh, the place to look are in degraded lands that are not already used uh, for agriculture in some sense. Uh, the not so good news is that we're looking for 500 million hectares at the same time that we're looking for more areas to grow food, fiber, energy, to biofuels, uh, carbon storage, and so on. And it's all within the context of climate change, so it's, it's not going to be easy. It's a big task. Um, so doing these things with land, you could, you could get as much as two petagrams of carbon out, out of the atmosphere keep it out, uh, and you need another two petagrams from reducing fossil fuel emissions for a total of four to get you back to this four billion metric tons growth rate in the atmosphere. Um, <clears throat> this slide did not make the translation from one, in fact I lost another curve, but the, the main point to take home here is 
that I've been talking about net emissions from land use change, and in fact, we have a lot more to work with because the gross emissions are three times higher. In other words, there's three times more carbon being released, two petagrams of which are being taken up in regrowing forests. So this is looking at management, not just in terms of its net effect, but in terms of gross emissions and gross uptake. So there's, there's more at our disposal to work with than just that, that net uh, release of about one. Um, <clears throat> The, uh, as I say, taking four petagrams of carbon out of the emissions would stabilize concentrations, but only for, only for a while. Uh, and the sinks would start to uh, <coughs> uh, decrease over time. And you'd have to increase the amount of, uh, increase the reductions in emissions. Uh, it's, it would only work for a while, and historically, the world's been going in the, in the other direction, which is not a surprise to you. The top graph here shows the areas. I don't think you can probably read, but you, the point is that areas in managed systems have been increasing. Areas in natural forests or herb lands, grasslands have been decreasing. The bottom two show the decreases in carbon as a result, decreases first in Middle graph decreases due to in the vegetation as trees get converted to <coughs> cornfields, for example. And then bottom graph shows decreases in soil organic matter, soil carbon, as a result of cultivation. Uh, and this just shows a little bit more of the detail. The th three bars on the left are tropical regions, Latin America, tropical Africa, and tropical Asia. The bar on the right is the sum of those three. And this just is to sort of indicate what the big, big drivers of deforestation or land use are. It's, it's uh, <coughs> croplands or, or agriculture of some kind. Uh, the, the orange bars there are sh shifting cultivation, which is a form of agriculture, but it's more of a rotational that involves some, re some fallow forests. Uh, the interesting thing here is, is peatlands, draining and burning of peatlands for oil palm plantations in tropical Asia, in South and Southeast Asia, are responsible for as much as three-tenths of a petagram per year. And that really jacks up the contribution from Asia. You can see down on the bottom, below the zero line, are the uh, influence of plantations that are underway. There are they're expanding the areas in plantations in, in most of the uh, developing regions, tropical regions. Um, and this is to get the, the RCP, <coughs> land use emissions, according to RCP. RCP is representative carbon pathways. This is looking forward to the next IPCC report. And there are uh, <coughs> integrated assessment models that have come up with four different um, emissions pathways <clears throat> from very little to very large emissions. Um, are those, that, sorry, those are the total emissions, yeah, over the period 20 to 2100, 2000 to 20, over the next 100 years. And you can see that all of them start turning deforestation way down after the year 2000. And I, uh, those, those, are, those are nice projections, but I don't see that happening Really. So I wonder what's going to make the, the flip there in that curve that's been going up for a century and <clears throat> now may drop. Um, all right, let me talk a little bit about the unmanaged land, which is the big surprise in a sense, or uh, the big unknown. Um, I've, I made the point in that those first slides that this, this residual terrestrial sink is something that's that's got to be there to conserve carbon. Uh, and here shows on the left the sources of carbon, and on the right those three sinks, atmosphere, land, and oceans. And as I said before, about half of what's emitted stays in the atmosphere, and a quarter goes to land, and a quarter to the oceans. Uh, and the question is, well, <clears throat> what about this? What about these sinks? I'm going to talk mostly about the terrestrial sink, but the same arguments apply to the ocean sink, you'd expect 
as the world warms, the ocean waters will take up less carbon dioxide. They'll become more acidic, and because of the carbon chemistry, they will. Uh, it'll be <coughs> more difficult to add more carbon. The same is true on land, but probably for different reasons. You'd expect the warming would increase respiration, and that, in fact, this sink on land might decline through time. So far, as evidenced by land and ocean, those, those, the sinks through time have been increasing, and they've been increasing in proportion to emissions, and that's just fantastic. That's, that's nature on our side, just taking the same proportion of whatever we emit and putting it into oceans and land. <clears throat> that, whether that will continue is, is an open question as, as climate changes. Uh, ha how, how has this uh, residual sink been behaving in the past? Well, it's been increasing in proportion, as I said, but if it's going to change, we will s probably see it in something called the airborne fraction, which is, is simply the fraction of emissions that stay in the atmosphere. Not, I've been saying all along it's been about 50 percent, about 50 percent of fossil and land emissions remain in the atmosphere. And we can look at this every year because we know the emissions and we know what's in the atmosphere. And uh, it's it's a it's a trick. It's not a trigger. It's a uh, it's just like the average annual global surface temperature is not all about climate change, but it's the best indicator we have of what the rate of climate change is. And I would argue that this airborne fraction is the best indicator we have of whether the carbon cycle is pretty much staying as it has been in the past or whether it's beginning to change. Um, <clears throat> and these are the terms necessary. There, the emissions on the top and there's the atmospheric increase. Those come out to be over the last 10 years uh, an airborne fraction of 46 percent. That's the roughly 50 percent I've been talking about. And here's Here's a, an analysis of the airborne fraction over time since 1960. The dashed line is sort of the, the mean through all of that variability. All that variability makes it hard to say whether there's been a change in the airborne fraction or not. And the variability, I will add, is largely due to uh, uh, variations in terrestrial metabolism as a, as a function of of not climate so much as, as weather. If there's a long spring, if the springs are warm or wet, the plants will take up more carbon. If it's, on the other hand, if growing seasons are shortened or if uh, <clears throat> weather is particularly dry in some parts, of that will decrease the uptake of carbon. So you can see globally there's a big variation year to year in what ter terrestrial systems are doing, but there's some indication that this airborne fraction has been has increased a little bit over this time frame. That's the wrong, that's the direction you don't want to see. That means the land and oceans are taking up somewhat less of a proportion than they had in the past. It means the air, if if the airborne fraction was one, everything that gets released stays in the atmosphere. Like I say, it's about 50 percent. Half of what gets released goes into oceans and land sinks, and you want that. Uh, fraction not to decrease. <clears throat> uh, it's hard to say whether it's increasing or not, but I, I would argue that this is the best way to look really to see almost in real time uh, whether that uh, fraction's changing. Uh, and the lack of a trend, no clear trend, no upward ticking, uh, the continued growth of terrestrial and ocean sinks in proportion to emissions is, is remarkable because we've already had, uh, what, seven-tenths of a degree centigrade warming. <clears throat> uh, and it means, as I said, we, nature's been working on our side. Uh, <clears throat> I can't be, uh, I don't get a lot of confidence from that, although it's worked so far. This continues to increase as a sink, but I worry uh, that as climate changes more, that will start to diminish, and then the atmosphere goes up faster than it has been. All right, so that, what that means for carbon manage management is that part of any management package should probably think from the outset at limiting the extent and rate of climate change. 
so that you don't change the uh, ability of these natural sinks to take up carbon. If, if, if the strength of those natural sinks decreases, it'll be a lot harder to manage carbon in the ways that we are talking about. And so far, half of what's been emitted has gone into these natural sinks. So let me summarize. I've mentioned a few times for a while, and I thought one way to uh, cross-cut through the end here would just remind you when that popped up. One, you could uh, stabilize concentrations if you re reduced emissions by about four petagrams of carbon per year, because that won't work for long. You'll have to keep reducing emissions because of the carbon system. Nature has been on our side, but I'm not convinced it'll stay there as the climate changes. And finally, carbon management on land, I mentioned two of the big possibilities, uh, will work for a while. Uh, it won't work for long because once you've grown up um, 500 million hectares or some large area of forest, once they're grown, they're, they're holding that carbon, but they're no longer taking it out of the atmosphere. They're storing it, but they're not actively taking it out. Um, and, and so carbon management on land buys time for the development of alternatives to fossil fuel, but it shouldn't take any pressure off the need to uh, get out of fossil fuels. Uh, and once again, I'll end just showing the, um, the emissions from deforestation or changes in land use and the emissions from fossil fuels. And you can see that uh, if these trends continue, land just plays a tinier and tinier part in the uh, in the missions and so time is time is limited thank you very much <laughs> that was You can sit, if you sit in the other one, you won't, the light won't bother you. In case we want to pull up the slides again. Right. We can just leave it there. Okay. So for those of you that are not at this moment getting something to drink or eat but are in the back, please do come forward and have a seat for the Q&A. Um, I'm Mary Elena Carr. I'm the Associate Director of the Climate Center, and I will be your moderator this afternoon. So if you'd like to ask questions, and I do encourage you to do so, please come to the mic because we are recording and we'll take your questions as you come up. And while people start summoning towards the beget to the front of the room, I would like to ask you a question. So I'm an oceanographer, and I know that as climate changes, there are changes in the structure of the ocean water column of the surface that will lead probably to less uptake of carbon. What are the things that we would expect for terrestrial ecosystems as climate changes to, so that it isn't, nature wouldn't be on our side in a while. Um, uh, I th think the, the first thing you think of is that, um, is that respiration, that process that releases CO2, is more sensitive usually to temperature than is photosynthesis. That's not entirely true over the whole spectrum of temperature changes, but, um, but the point is photosynthesis is often tied into the photo period, and that's not as likely to change as much with a temperature rise as respiration. And there's a lot of organic matter in soils, uh, and I guess it's particularly vulnerable in soils that are now in permafrost. So if you were to thaw, thaw the permafrost, you, you bring back, you make accessible a lot of carbon that has been stored for a long time out of the cycle more or less. So those are, those are a couple. Um, th those are the, the big ones that I worry about. And, and I haven't mentioned methane, but I think methane is also sense, has deposits both in peats and offshore that are temperature sensitive. So. That's a big one. Thank you. Yep. Uh, regarding the uh, airborne fraction, um, 
You say it's 0.46 right now, it's, but it's, it's, it's very low. If it were to approach a certain level, say 0.6 or 0.7, and uh, on, on average, is there is a sort of a critical level in, in theory whereby we might hit a point where there are feedback loops that accelerate the, the amount of uh, carbon in the air and so, and so on? And in other words, we sort of get out of control to some extent. Not, not because of the airborne fraction. I just look at that as sort of an empirical measure. It's not driving anything. It's more the result. But, but your question is a good one. Uh, if the temperature rises or enough or rapidly enough to start processes in motion might we uh, just enhance the warming and that's <clears throat> most of the processes that we know of move in that a positive feedback move in that direction and and obviously it, it hasn't happened yet we those it's just like i said it's remarkable to me that land that the total sink for the world has increased in proportion to emissions, despite the fact that climate's already warmed three quarters of a degree, um, <clears throat> the that's the worry. Of course, is that you would pass some tipping point and uh, release a lot more carbon, and f for that you really have to go back into the paleo record and look for right. analogs. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep. Hello, I'm Roma Stibravi, president of NGO Sustainability. Um, I have a two-part question. First, does the RED program in any way uh, enhance your ideas about use of forests and expanding uh, reforestation? Uh, the other half of the question is policy, because all scientific research then has to encourage policy. And we have the very embarrassing situation in the United States of having eight uh, Republican presidential candidates, seven of which denied climate change. <clears throat> so you scientists have to get the policy much more out into the open. Uh, let me take that first one first. <laughs> um, I look at red as a mechanism to um, <clears throat> to preserve forests and to keep carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, but it doesn't, you know, I, and at the same time, it also rewards countries for, for taking action, uh, which without those rewards, you know, there's an opportunity cost for keeping your forest and not turning it into something else. So I look at the, at, at at red as a <clears throat> one possible way to to ha move things in the right direction, and 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 now there's red plus, which adds even more uh, sort of ingredients, if you will. It's it should enhance carbon sinks. It should manage forests sustainably. It would include uh, some thoughts of biodiversity. Um, there are still a lot of worries about red, <coughs> and. and um, <coughs> I guess I won't go there now, but I can go to your other question. I couldn't agree more that we, I'm not sure it falls only on the scientists, but I agree with you that there's a big education challenge out there. Um, we talked a lot about that. I was talking to graduate students at lunch, and that's most of what we spent our time talking about. And I don't have the answers to that, but I, I think you can fairly make <coughs> You can make the argument that <clears throat> there's a greater need for figuring out how to communicate that than there is for doing more scientists. Doing more science. I, I don't don't ever quote me on that, but I, we know enough now that we should be uh, reducing emissions, and so it's more a question of what do you do uh, for, for those who not only don't believe it but just don't want to. And I, like I said, I don't have an answer at the center where I work. We're, we're interested in the scientific publications, but we're also interested in putting it in front of policymakers and so on. And, um, <clears throat> but it's a good question, how to best do that. And um, it's not working. Yeah, the Earth Institute, same, same way. So I just wanted to let those who are not uh, very cognizant of all these acronyms. Red is reduced emissions through 
uh, reduce deforestation and land degradation, or something cool. along those lines. That's close. <laughs> Pretty close. Do you feel like, sorry, do you feel like your uh, research might be something that could be misconstrued by policymakers <clears throat> as a disincentive for getting off of fossil fuels, given how effective the carbon sinks are? Yeah, no, it could be, both. Both, um, if we were effective in managing land to, to take the pressure off fossil fuels, I mean, I made, I think I made the point that <clears throat> if, if it's an, a window, let's say, of 30 or 40 years when you really could use land, it's, those 30 or 40 years have to be spent developing alternatives. They're not just, they're just not, they're not a reason to put off doing that, but they have to be used. And with respect to natural sinks, yeah. If you're paying attention, you could say nature's on our side. Um, but, <clears throat> uh, but if you think about the feedbacks, uh, you're not too sanguine about that. It's worked so far. Uh, my name is Richard Weinstein. I happen to be an attorney. I'm not a, uh, a scientist, but since I was at EPA for many years, I learned a lot about the science that the legal pra ap applications required me to know. But it sounds like to me that your, your discipline of sustainable development is a divergence from the environmental programs that were in effect in the, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and even up until the point when global warming was in, was recognized as a problem. How does this translate, though, into uh, developing a limitation, an, em an effluent, I mean, an emission standard, or some something that could go on, hit the ground, with effect in the actual technology? And, um, or is sustainable development more concerned with what you've described as the sinks and the correlations between these two? Wow, I'm not sure I got all that, but I, the, um, I think sustainable development would mean you, you harvest <clears throat> forests, for example, in such a way that you don't run down the capital. So you have the, har the forest is there again in 50 years for, and so on and so on and so on. And that, <clears throat> that still, that's sustainable, that works, um, and in fact, one of the arguments, this may be a digression, one of, one of the worries about planting lots of forests is that you've just made a whole bunch of fuel, and if that all burned up, for example, you haven't accomplished anything. That's, I don't think that's quite true. You could have, if, if have a forest in a rotation cycle, let's say, so that every 50 years it's harvested, even forgetting what you do with the products, and you could put those in houses, and they might last a long time. You. You still have more carbon on average in that forest, even though it's repeatedly turned over, than you would if it weren't a forest. And I think the same is true for fires, really. Um, and that, there was a second part, or the, the how main do, part that I didn't. How do you. Um, how, how do. With greenhouse gas goals, or reductions, and, and make it, you know, on the ground? How does it affect, you know. Well, the nice. Like Oil companies or, or yeah. refineries or whatever. <laughs> do you do that? I, I, I do that at a um, say global level, as I talked about here. I, I, um, I turned. I think you need. Uh, well, you need both the grassroots support, education, and pushing forward, and you need leadership in the government. And I. I might as well take this opportunity. I think it's government's role to look after the public interest. And this is public interest. Um, that's, and there are, there are lots and lots of, of mechanisms on the ground or f technology being invented of the kind we need. I think the other way to do it is to, <clears throat> is, is to recognize the problem and put prices on carbon, and then technology starts working out the best ways to do it. So, I, so the cap and trade in that re respect should should work. Uh, but you, but you need you need to have the will, whether it's from the top or the bottom. You need a lot more will than we have now. <clears throat> 
I'd like to know why the focus is always on tropical forests. Are boreal forests much less efficient as a sinks? No, the, the um, focus is on the tropical forest because that's where the deforestation is now. But if you go back 100 years, all, most of that carbon emission being emitted from land use was in temperate zone and boreal forests, or mostly temperate zone. Uh, so it's sort of funny. In the tropics, there's something you can do about it. You can stop deforestation. If you're in the boreal system, boreal forest, you can make the argument that gee, we don't want climate to change so much as to thaw the permafrost and so on. There's not as much we can do actively. So I think that's it. But it's not, I mean, it's where the action is now rather than uh, economic um, greed. <laughs> My name is Gil <coughs> Excuse me. My name is Kelvin Stevens, and I teach environmental economics at Pratt. And I want to ask another policy question, but looking backwards this time, kind of, uh, what policy do you think has been most effective so far, and is it scalable and extendable? And then the question about the um, the slippery slopes, these uh, feedback effects, both the tundra and the um, the one, the methane in the ocean, the met methane hydrates or something. If you is anyone done studies about the shape of that? of that function or kind of a sense of timing. I know it's gradual, but, but how that's going to kick off and, and the, the more precise nature of that feedback? Is that, I don't, is that, you know, do you I understand, understand the question? question. I'm not. Yeah, and, and I don't think enough is known. I know people who've modeled the thawing of permafrost th think that <clears throat> Uh, that there'll be an, an initial carbon uptake before it flips over and becomes a source. And I don't, it's, it, there are time lags, but I think it's going to be different f depending on, on the gas and where you're talking about. So uh, I, I, don't, I don't think we have a temperature limit or a rate of change. I, I, th I personally think we've not uh, met the objective of the UN FCCC, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. The objective was to limit, uh, sorry, was to stabilize the concentrations before uh, we started to interfere dangerously with the climate system. I, I think we have not made that. We're past that and it's now how to uh, limit so that the changes are not, not just damaging but they're not catastrophic. Uh, and you had a first question. What was? It was a policy question. Yeah. Looking back, what's worked? <clears throat> well, f I I look at Europe as working better than than most places, and uh, they have a European trading carbon trading system, which is gosh, I don't know how many billions of dollars each year. Uh, but that doesn't work unless you have um, restrictions on how much emissions you can have. So I look at that as working, but I look at, I don't know that it's policy, but for some reason the perspective of Europeans is a little different from the perspective of Americans. I don't know whether it's because they've been living in their country many, many, many more years than we have. We still have frontiers, our frontier spirit. Uh, that's not policy exactly, but <clears throat> I can't do better than that. <laughs> I, <clears throat> sorry. Um, earlier this week, I showed students in my course a global map of atmospheric nitrogen deposition. And this was more in the context of estuarine and coastal eutrophication than anything to do with the carbon cycle. But um, I'm wondering what the current thinking is about whether or not the growth in the terrestrial carbon sink is influenced by industrial fixation of nitrogen and the fact that it gets out in falls onto the ecosystems. Yeah, no, good question. That's, I mentioned that there were uh, several hypotheses out there for explaining <clears throat> why natural systems would be taking up more carbon. And one of them is that, is that the deposition of nitrogen that, we, that human activity has put in, in a fixed form that's useful to plants. And they've done it through internal combustion engine and through actually fertilizer applications and growing of more legumes. So there are a lot of reasons to put nitrogen around that. That's one of the f four, uh, foremost 
arguments, and there are good papers for experimental evidence for showing that most, well, particularly temperate systems, ecosystems are limited by nitrogen, so that ought to work in that direction. You can, you can overdo it, of course, if the concentrations of nitrogen are too high. Um, the other, so the answer is yes, it still hasn't been shot down, it's still a good contender, uh, and it shares with uh, carbon dioxide fertilization of plant growth and changes in climate. It may be that the warming at high latitudes has so far uh, stimulated plant growth, evidence it has, if the warming comes with the same amount of moisture. If the warming comes <coughs> with drying, then then forests don't do so well, and that's related somewhat probably to the western uh, <coughs> be beetle, beetle outbreaks in the pine forests. So those are the kinds of surprises that <coughs> beetle, beetles aren't in your model, but uh, something has made the forest weaker. Okay, uh, Peter Schlosser, Climate Center, Earth Institute. Uh, Richard, I have a question about your potential of two gigatons of uh, reduction of the atmospheric inventory or the atmospheric sink. What do you think the chances are that we actually will accomplish that? And how high will the atmospheric CO2 level be by the time we would have reached that full potential if we ever would get to implementing it? Um, well, I, I think the, the point for making the, the argument I do is more to say, is to give it the, the context of what you could do with land, how big an effect, what you would have to do if you were serious. I, I don't, well, the one thing I see that is in that direction is what's sometimes called the, uh, oops, now I've forgotten, but in, if, when you go through development, you sort of use up resources like crazy. You reach a certain level of development, and, and if it, in the case of forests, you start putting the forests back. China's doing that. Even India's doing that. And the U.S. certainly did it. Uh, it's the tr uh, forest, transition. Trans forest transition. Thank you. Um, so that, so when, what I'm talking about are rates of deforestation that are going up globally, but at the same time, you can, you can go to particular regions particular countries which have the, the reverse going. They are increasing the area of forests. That's not getting to your questions of, of your question of what, how likely is it to happen and how fast? Um, I, <clears throat> not, not fast enough. I, I think, I, th <coughs> I think the public does not realize the rate at which things are happening and the consequences, so. They're not influencing their leaders, and their leaders are caught in other things. So I, I, I don't know how far it'll go before it's, it'll be clear. In my less than optimistic moments, I figure it's going to take more than a few years of Katrina's one after another. It's going to take uh, probably food shortages, and in, in this country we probably won't have them. But it's but we did have a dust bowl. So I'm guessing that that will get people's attention, and then the question is, at that point, how fast can you do things? I don't, not very optimistic. Um, so if we started reforestation today on the scale that you recommend, um, is there a time lag between then and when those forests start effectively stocking carbon? Do they, is there, do they reach a peak after a certain point, or does it sort of start right away? Well, they start right away, but it's tiny. And then the, let's say let's say they could accumulate carbon for a hundred years. They're they're accumulating it most rapidly in years twenty and thirty and forty. So it's sort of a logistic curve. It's slow, fast, and then slow. So yeah, it doesn't happen overnight, like I think I probably said. But um, <coughs> but uh, stopping deforestation is more. You know, it's that. It's funny, the, um, on land, the emissions are quick. The uptake is slow. And there's an asymmetry there that's hard to get around. Uh, so a question, uh, sorry, a comment and then two questions. Uh, the comments first, if you're wondering what made the forest weaker for pine beetles, that was us. Uh, we 
increased the average age of the force by fire suppression, which uh, put the forest more into the beetle's preferred um, range. They only eat mature forest. And we also increased the average temperature, which uh, you need a couple, you need about three, two or three solid weeks of minus 30 or minus 40 degree temperature to kill off beetle during the winter. It doesn't happen anymore, so you get the spread. Greater food support, yeah, and that stuff. Yeah. Um, questions. First, uh, in the IPCC's first, uh, when they started talking about this, it was land use, land use change, and forestry. So it was deforestation, reforestation, but also forest management. Um, is there a reason why you didn't bring up forest management so much? Is it just because it's a smaller scale than, yeah, than the other two? Yeah, just because I'm looking, looking for the two big, big things you could do quickly. Um, the, yeah, I mean, I mean you, you know that ARD, well, I don't know. Red is somewhat different from what the temperate and boreal or the developed countries are dealing with. And someday those two have to come together in terms of how to manage forests. I didn't use forest management just uh, because I think of that as more ha um, how frequently do you harvest, what hmm. what cropping systems do you use, and so on. I, I, I use deforestation and land use change just because those, those will have a bigger effect per unit of land. Hmm. And the second question is, if you, when you're talking about reforestation, you talked about doing a cropping cycle. Has anybody thought about the actual um, aggregate carbon life cycle implications of that? Because now you're harvesting, you're presumably processing, transporting the wood, so you have emissions associated with that. Is are you really getting the same bang for for the carbon? No, as we thought no, of before. I didn't look downstream at all, so I'm just. Uh, yeah, I. I mean, no, that's a good question. It, which the, and that question applies to any any technology as in terms of how much energy it takes to implement it and um, um, I no I'm just thinking of a normal rotation period and what what and really the question is what you do with your product products in sustainable management. Hi, I'm Bill Hewitt. I write and I teach at NYU. Um, can you talk a little bit about agricultural land management and some of the emissions we're getting from some of our practices and some ideas that you might have, like, <clears throat> excuse me, a favorite of mine, biochar, whether or not that's in your thinking? Okay. Uh, well, as you, as you know, agriculture is really responsible for a, a lot of emissions, greenhouse gases in general, I mean, because methane and nitrous oxide are big there as well as carbon. In fact, the, the land use doesn't, at least in the, in, the, in the carbon accounting required of countries, uh, land use is over here and agriculture is over there. So, <clears throat> so, so if you take a forest and cut it down, that's, that's counted over here as a land use, but the kinds of intensity you do with agriculture is, is in another pool. And I should just say, I, I have, I've said nothing about intensity, and that's, that's la missing in the kinds of work we do, but if you look at more specific local areas, you, you have to start taking into account the management processes, which uh, for agriculture may be the, the cropping systems, the crops themselves, the varieties, the fertilizer applications, and so on and so on. There's a couple of reasons to look at nitrogen applications, not only N2O, but the dead zones in the Gulf from nitrogen coming down the Mississippi River and such. That, um, I'm, to remind me again what, that's a, that's a sort of a scare, harebrained review of what comes to mind about agriculture, but you asked something. Well, what else can we be doing in managing um, oh, okay. and uh, well, with respect to nitrogen, apparently, uh, just for insurance, farmers use a little more nitrogen than they need to just because the incremental cost isn't that much more, but that's the stuff that comes off, so, and either as gas or as uh, nitrate down, down water. So, so you you could do much you could couple much more closely or at least the potential is there to to couple when you apply the fertilizer and when it's needed that's all that's all better understanding of the system uh biochar my uh, that looks so good that you have to be worried but I, as far as i know my, uh there just are not enough 
data yet in enough systems, but to take garbage, burn it, turn it into charcoal, put it in the soil where it not only helps take out toxins, helps accumulate carbon, uh, all kinds of good, it sounds great. I just feel more comfortable if it got even more attention for a while. Attention in the sense of research. <clears throat> Uh, when a tree burns or rots after it dies, does it release any carbon that's uh, it's absorbed growing? And if so, then as a carbon sink, isn't it just a temporary fix? Mm -hmm. Yes, a, a tree dies and all, eventually all of what it took up and stored in wood, leaves, is released back to the atmosphere. Some fraction will probably accumulate in the soil. So. So a tree is a temporary fix, um, but, uh, but increasing the area of forests, as long as you keep them forests, is the, the taking up of carbon eventually stops, but you've got a lot of carbon held in that forest. So the, in a sense, the verb sink goes away, but the noun sink, well, all that stored carbon <coughs> is still there. It's not. So I guess you could argue that once you've grown up the forest, yes, yeah, and I, and that's what I meant by having a a window of thirty or forty years if you were to plant a lot of trees. Uh -huh. Once they're grown up, then they're holding that carbon, but they're not helping anymore, taking more out of the atmosphere. But then, would subsequent generations of trees reabsorb the carbon that released by the earlier trees that had died? Yeah, that's yeah, that's that's the idea behind say sustainable. Management. You could you could manage for sustainable carbon in the sense that, in fact, in fact, you could get ahead if you grew trees, harvested them, and put them all in long-term storage. Let the forest grow back. You over time, you'd be building up the carbon in in that storage. The forest would sort of spin at some average level of carbon density, if you will. But the but the stocks, the products may build up for a long time. Storage in what form, like lumber? Yep, lumber, houses, mm -hmm. paper, landfills. I don't know how long landfills stay. New landfills are fairly effective at keeping people actually suggest just cutting down trees and saying that landfills to store the carbon here. Huh. So. In that sense, it's not terribly different from the carbon capture and storage. You can let the tree do the capture, take the tree and put it down in an old salt mine and not let it decay back to the atmosphere. I mean, that's, I don't think anybody's proposing that, but I mean, in theory, you could, you could use photosynthesis in trees to, to take carbon out of the air, and there aren't a lot of things that do that, and then, and then take that tree and put it somewhere where it won't decay. Okay, lumber. and one more question yeah. then. Is there sort of an upper limit in terms of um, storage capacity that forests represent including all the potentially reforested forests we could come up with? Yeah, we calculate that we've, given the present, the climate that we're in now, in other words, you can change things if you go way back in time to get colder or hotter, but if, under present climate that we think we've lost globally something like two or 200 or 300 billion metric tons of carbon as a result of cutting down forests and putting them into agriculture, cities, and so on. So that's, that's on the order of the total amount of fossil fuel carbon that we've released to date. So in, again, in theory, if you put all those forests back and the, and the organic matter in the soil, you could take two or 300 mil, billion tons of carbon out of the atmosphere. But most, where would you do that? That's the problem. Most of that land that's been cleared from forests is now in wheat and corn and rice, and so it's, you're not, you, you can't have that back. Yeah, I, I, I read a long time ago that Vermont and New Hampshire, after the original settlement um, were, yeah. they had been all forested essentially, and the, they were down to 10% forested land, and now they're back up to 10% non-forested land. 
Yeah. So maybe, you know, I'm not, that's not necessarily a desirable outcome if you extend it, you know, to the Midwest or something. But no, but that, no, and in a way, the um, New England is almost the, what, the poster child of recovering forests that were cut down. And, and then that agriculture sort of moved west and trees grew up again. If you keep looking, and that's that forest transition in a sense, in the Northeast is the best example of it. But if you look there now, it's deforestation is happening again, and this time it's for uh, industry, commerce, and second homes. So that's a forest transition that hasn't made it into the books yet, but not. A, you worry whether the level level of affluence goes up to the point when you start wanting that forest again. Okay. <coughs> Uh, Teresa Hernandez, Climate Center. Um, I have a question about the framing of your presentation. Um, you talk about how we have been emitting increasingly and the planet through atmosphere, land, and ocean is absorbing what we're emitting correspondingly and you call this nature being on our side but in fact the planet is reabsorbing the carbon we're emitting but at there are implications for that. Um, ocean acidification and lots of things going on there, the atmosphere um, taking in the carbon means warming and mm -hmm. all these things. So why do you call it nature being on our side? Because I think that might mislead people into thinking that, oh, well, the planet's absorbing it, so it's okay and it's not a problem. But that's not what you're saying. No, that's, a, no, that's I hadn't looked at it that way. The, uh, your, I mean, the acidification of the ocean is a good, a good example. On land, it's harder for me to see why taking up carbon would be bad. But, <clears throat> um, but, but you're right. I I say that just in the context of carbon and climate, uh, that it, what I would have expected was that as as a result of warming, that the sinks on land and ocean would decline not increase and so I'm so I'm impressed by that continued not just continued uptake but increasing uptake on land and oceans so far just it's not even constant and hasn't declined it's increasing and that just really surprises me but not at I don't have to no call effect. it I don't have to but call it nature's on our side but uh, <laughs> Uh, but in terms of keeping carbon out of the atmosphere, it's doing a good job. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the, um, the, the, the peatland, and I wondered, is that uh, the, the peatland carbon increase, is that due to the drying out of the peat, similar to uh, what we have up in the uh, the northern latitudes where you have the permafrost drying out, so it's most, mostly the carbon release just from drying, or is it, is there a slice and burn effect in this lower latitude where the palm trees are planted or something? Yeah, it's, it, it, but you, it's a major propor proportion of your, uh, one of your graphs, and so I just... Yeah, it's, it's both, uh, because I think, um, I think they, they drain first. They drain it, and then they'll burn it as they get rid of the forests and plant and so it's it's it can be meters deep right. in some places and incredibly thick yeah, yeah. so yeah. it's a you know a, that too will have its limit but it's 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 uh adding quite a bit it's a surprise it seems only to have happened in the last real well, in a big way in the last decade primarily indonesia i guess yeah. right yeah. I didn't introduce myself before. My name is Jeff Twine, and I've been involved in renewable energy for a, a number of years. Uh, my question is about biofuels. Um, let's, let's assume that the cellulose problem is solved, and, and we could actually convert stuff like switchgrass and, and crop residues to, uh, to ethanol or, or biodiesel or something like that. What kind of effect do you think that would have on balance in terms of the uh, carbon cycle? You know, it's something we achieve that, and hopefully we will achieve that, because there's lots of underutilized land that could be utilized for energy production if it was beneficial. In yeah, a couple, uh, 
two things. One is if if you put it on unutilized land, that's that's sort of the trick. I mean, that's that's great. I'm thinking the, the mid Midwest. Midwest and you know further out where this where switchgrass grows all yeah. over the place and. Uh, yeah. So it's not so it's not that you're taking land out of crops and putting right. it into exactly. So that's a, so that would seem to work. And um, um, what was the so that's one worry is the indirect effects of using biofuels here and having and taking more land. But how so about the energy uh, the so carb should, carbon cycle thing? Uh, in, in terms of carbon cycle, you're, uh, right. you're going to be burning that later on. It's growing, so it's absorbing some. When it's green, it's absorbing some. Carbon, I think right? you're neutral. If it's sustainable, it, it's neutral. And if, besides being sustainable and neutral, you are re not using that equivalent amount of fossil so fuel, you are ahead. Yeah. If you're just adding more fuel, more carbon, you're neutral, but you haven't done anything helpful. Right. So it's really you really have to use it to re reduce fossil. And reduce. Of course, the question again arises that how much, suppose if, if it came about, how much energy would it take to produce those yeah. fuels? You know. Yeah. Which is no, the question nobody asks in terms of fossil fuels. I must say, when I talk about the Keystone Pipeline and all that stuff, my question is, what amount of energy does it take to take that those, those uh, that energy out of the and to transport that energy from the oil sands in Alberta? You know, yep. but people don't ask, seem to ask those kind of questions. No, they're asking what it takes to get oil out of shale. Yeah, yeah. It takes Good. a lot of oil to get oil or gas. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, good point. So I had a follow-up question on the idea of the two, the number two. So have there been studies that actually <coughs> indicate what type of area needs to be used to be able to restore the two pedograms through reforestation? Well, it's, de it's avoiding deforestation and reforestation, right, or afforestation. Yeah. So obviously in a growing population, there's the demands for food and for fiber and for just places to live. Have there been studies that indicate what would be necessary um, in terms of area? You, you do provide the area. It's like three times the U.S., you said, I think, or two no, times. Half, half, half the it's U.S. Not that oh, big. that's nothing. Um, <laughs> it's, so. it's, it's three times less than what we have in crops okay. globally. But that so. is feeding people. Yeah. And there are people who don't have food. So, so it's, it has, is there an idea that, yes, this is doable? <clears throat> Uh, well, you know, ec economy always creeps into that. There's, there's land that you think nobody's using and you don't have any idea who owns it. And, but, but if you sit down and start using it, someone will show up who will claim it. And that'll be particularly true if you, I think, want to... Uh, I, th I would go first to a bunch of... Um, a, abandoned the great lands that are no longer in agriculture and they're not in forests because they've been worn out. Those are not your first choice for where to plant a forest, but nevertheless they may be the lands that are most available. Um, because it makes no sense to to put it where a forest is existing. It's going to be hard. You don't want to put it where there is now cropland. That leaves natural grasslands and other lands that are probably too dry, never supported forests. So you're really down to places that once supported forests and now are not really productive and uh, are not supporting forests now. And whether that adds up to 500 million hectares, I'm not sure, but I, I think there's quite a bit of degraded land in, in parts of, certainly in parts of the tropics, and um, there's no reason to, to focus on the tropics in that respect, um, but I, but it's it's hard to identify those lands. But I think that's I, I think there have been studies from time to time. I just haven't s seen one recently that estimates what land area that is. And, and like I say, it's it's somewhat hard just because of the economic uh, condition. Uh, if it's <clears throat> it, it looks like it's available, but it might not be. Right. If you, you consulted with the owner. Right. Agency. Right. Is there a model or some uh, place where I could get a uh, overview of the variables that you're discussing and uh, uh, and get a gestalt? The, the limits to growth did this in the 70s, as you know. So, so could we, uh, is there a place where I could get a model or, or see a model or where someone is thinking about models to deal with the, the scenario? Uh, yeah, one of my slides showed 
Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a late student all the time. That's okay. The uh, R s something they have um, in preparation for the next uh, scientific assessment of how we're doing with respect to climate. There are four different modeling groups who have scenarios of what it would take to, or how likely it. Let, let, let's say what the pathway would be to stabilize concentrations at 450 parts per million, sure. 650, 850, and something else. And all of those groups uh, have their own model, which has both the economic and social aspects right. of it. And, and well, I can come to you after it's in. Yeah, and get that. I'm sorry, I came late, but I'll no problem. Okay. I I can give you some of their uh, where to get it. In touch with them, I think, Very or can send it. Very good, thank you. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Puleng, and I'm from South Africa. I'm a student here at SIPA. So, my question is Do you think that the developing nations can actually achieve much greater economic growth without actually using the fossil fuels? Because sometimes the um, the view that is made by the developing nations during climate negotiations is that the developing countries should not impose uh, you know, climate rules on the developing nations because they've polluted over the years, they've built their economy because of you know, fossil fuels. I just want to hear your comments on that. Thanks. Uh, groan. That's, that's hard. I, I mean, I have... I have to admit that a lot of countries developed without fossil fuels because they were before fossil fuels, but that's a little bit cheating as an answer. I, um, I, most developments hap has happened because some resource has been used up, whether it was land or forests or, or fossil fuels. <clears throat> so you need some source of, of wealth, I, I guess. Um, in a, in a fair world, I would look to uh, increasing resource use and wealth in developing countries and decreasing it in the overdeveloped world. I, I, I mean, that's, that's what's fair, but I don't have any idea whether the developed world likes that idea particularly. Uh, so, but it's a good question whether I, I, come, I, I said that because if you ask whether can developing countries all reach a level of development like, for example, and then, I, then I stop because if it's, because for example, if I were to say the U.S., I think the U.S. does not have to be as consuming of resources as it is. So if you had the, if you had the right use of resources that were sustainable and such, then I would like to think it is possible. But it's going to take some shifting. In other words, developing and developed aren't, I don't, they aren't going to go like this. I, what has to eventually happen is something more like that. But I can say that, and I don't have a way to do it. <clears throat> well, that was a, certainly a really interesting discussion. And so please join me once again in thanking Richard. And we do have some cookies and coffee. Thank you.